And so if you ever watched one of those movies where the characters seem like they've been wandering forever and there's this like horrifying moment and realization that they've been going in circles. You know, it's not just a trope in the movies. There was a study done in 2009 of two groups of people lost in the wilderness. One group was in like the forest of Germany, the other in, in a place in the Saharan desert. Who signs up for this stuff? I don't know, that's another study for another time. But it found that people, when lost, especially without the help of like the sun and the moon, we go in circles and there are all kinds of theories as to why like like one leg is stronger than the other so we're inclined to walk in a curve but one biologist argues that circling is is, is one of the general laws of biology not a form of error he named it the the law of circular movement and he argues that it assures that lost animals will always be able to find their way back to home and familiarity so whether we like it or not he argued we circle to find our way back to familiar ground and I think about this study whenever I read Deuteronomy 2, 3, where God says, you've circled this mountain long enough, now turn north. And it seems like a simple verse, right? But some context, right? When Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, like you read in the book of Exodus or you've seen in all the movies, leaving Egypt, it's a 240 mile journey to the promised land. Now, one could typically walk this in less than two weeks. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 2 says that it's an 11 days journey. But when you read scripture, you see that it took the Israelites 40 years. And you think, how? Like, did their iPhone and the Maps app get stuck on avoid tolls and they didn't realize there was a much shorter route? Like, why did it take 40 years to go a straight line distance of 240 miles? Well, in scripture, we see that when they got to the promised land the first time, they didn't have faith. They doubted God. They, they outright disobeyed God. And so they, that generation went back into the wilderness where they did circles until the next generation was all that's left. And a two-week two trip took 40 years. And we joke it and we laugh, but some of us have been following Jesus for years now, be it five or 10 or 20 years, but we don't have a five or 10-year faith. We've got a one-year faith that we've lived 10 times over and over again because time and motion is not always indicative of progress. You know, some of us get stuck in a rut and we've been going and growing in circles. So when God says that, hey, you've circled this mountain long enough, turn north, he's, he's saying, hey, stop making circles and start making your way to the promised land. And my promise is, right, break this circuit. What's a circuit? Well, my brother used to be a beast on a bicycle. I'm talking like Lance Armstrong type cycling without the, the performance enhancing drugs and the scandals. And I used to love to go watch him race. And there were two kinds of races, right? Point A to point B races and circuit races. Races made up of, of going in circles and laps however many times. Now, Hebrews 12 talks about how we're to run our race with perseverance and how we've got a cloud of witnesses in heaven that watch us. But the race we're called to, it's not a circuit, right? We're called to a point B. And our journey may not be geographical, it's spiritual, but we're not called to go in circles. We're called to this race moving forward into spiritual maturity. And I share all of this because some things in life, they may not keep you from eternity, but they will keep you from maturity. And for us to step into maturity, we have to break away from the habits and thought patterns and scripts and perspectives that keep us going in circles and set our sights on point B. And our point B is to be like Christ in this life and be with him in the next. Now, the latter is a lock, right? If you've responded in faith and belief to Jesus and the grace that flows from the cross, we've been justified, right? Made right with God. But the process of sanctification, of growing like Christ that all of us are called to, that's a journey. You know, it's the author and theologian Eugene Peterson that calls this journey of sanctification long obedience in the same direction. But it's the author and explorer Ernest Ingersoll that defined a path or a trail as a happy promise to the anxious heart that you are going somewhere and are not wandering in a circle. See, God gives us pathways and promises, ways forward to grow in sanctification. We're not cursed to go in circles as our flesh and impulses like to do. Now, in simplest terms, that path forward is found here in God's word. And there are spiritual disciplines, though, paths you will walk in as you follow Christ. And at City Life, we've called these disciplines the 12 pathways as part of discipling people for years. Matter of fact, Pastor Fred right, wrote about it in this book on discipleship called Praxis and these pathways are prayer and scripture and worship and fasting and gathering and relationship and reaching and accountability, generosity and stewardship, serving and rest. The 12 pathways. 
These are paths that you will walk as you follow Christ and his word and grow more like him. They are spiritual paths that serve as happy promises to the anxious heart. You see, when people come to me and they, they feel dry or in a rut and restless or stuck in some wilderness season, there are a million reasons why they may be feeling like that. But I also often point them back to the pathways. Because as the prophet Jeremiah once said to God's people, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. Right? And you will find rest for your soul. That's one of those happy promises. So may you break the circuit and walk these paths and find those happy promises within scripture that help us walk with Jesus and look like Jesus and in doing so, find rest for our souls. God bless.